I think we should not have involved ourselves with the, the mafia. Uh, I think uh, an organization that does so is losing control of the security of its, of its information. I think we should have been afraid that we would open ourselves to blackmail. If I read you correctly, you're saying it's the involvement with the mafia that disturbed you and, and, and not the need or decision to assassinate a foreign leader. Correct. It's a chilling thought, made more chilling by the assassination of John Kennedy. The accusations linger. In some minds, the suspicions persist of a dark, unsolved conspiracy behind his murder. You can dismiss them, as many of us do, but knowing now what our secret government planned for Castro, the possibility remains. Once we decide that anything goes, anything can come home to haunt us. The sad thing of the last few years is, both with regard to Central America, where our covert activities have included assassination manuals, as well as uh, what may have occurred in Libya with regard to a bombing raid uh, on Qaddafi, a person no American can sympathize with, is that the assassination issue has reared its head again as an extreme example of a covert kind of activity. My own sense is we make a great, great mistake and we endanger one person above anyone else, and that's the president, if we engage in assassination types of techniques, because no foreign government can defeat the United States Army, but a lot of foreign individuals can come up with ways of killing an individual American citizen. Vietnam, 1968. American soldiers are fighting and dying in the jungles of Southeast Asia. But the Vietnam War didn't start this way. It started secretly, off the books, like so many of these ventures that have ended disastrously. The CIA got there early, soon after the Vietnamese won their independence from the French in 1954. Eisenhower warned that the nations of Southeast Asia would fall like dominoes if the communists led by Ho Chi Minh took over all Vietnam. To hold the line, we installed in Saigon a puppet regime under No Dien Jim. American trained commandos were used to sabotage bus and rail lines and contaminate North Vietnam's oil supplies. Vice President Nixon brought moral support to Jim, but the situation kept getting worse. President Kennedy sent the Green Berets to Vietnam and turned to full-scale counterinsurgency. He had once said Vietnam was the ultimate test of our will to stem the tide of world communism. By the time of his death, there were 15,000 Americans there. They were called advisors. The secret war was leading only to deeper involvement and more deception. It is my duty to the American people to report that renewed hostile actions against United States ships on the high seas in the Gulf of Tonkin have today required me to order the military forces of the United States to take action in reply. This president was not telling the truth either. The action in the Gulf of Tonkin was not unprovoked. South Vietnam had been conducting secret raids in the area against the North, and the American destroyer, ordered into the battle zone, had advance warning it could be attacked. But Johnson seized the incident to stampede Congress into passing the Gulf of Tonkin resolution. He then used it as a blank check for the massive buildup of American forces. You have always had presidents who, as an aberration, will act uh, on their own, and, and then afterward look to Congress for authorization retrospectively of their act. But in this case, you had a full-dress defense of inherent presidential power, inherent executive power, and the power as commander-in-chief to use the Army and the Navy whatever way they wanted. The Constitution is clear on this, too. Congress shall have the power to declare war. April 1965, two battalions of Marines land in South Vietnam, the first of more than two and a half million Americans to fight there with no congressional declaration of war. The dirty little war that began in secret is reaching full roar. Free fire zones, defoliation, 
the massacre at Milan, Napalm, and the CIA's Operation Phoenix to round up, torture, and kill suspected Viet Cong. We were murdering these people, incinerating them. Ralph McGee was there for the CIA and helped set up South Vietnam's secret police. My efforts had resulted in the deaths of many people. And I, I just, for me, it was a period when I guess I was, I consider myself nearly insane. I, I just couldn't reconcile what I had been and what I was at the time becoming. Uh, and, and it was so painful for me. It, it's just hard for me to uh, express it because I became completely antisocial. I couldn't deal with anybody. I, I just was dealing mentally. It was an internal battle. Every night I would lay in my bed and think, well, this can't be true. Why are we doing this? Why don't we stop? Why don't, why can't we accept? And I was just a battle all night long, all day long. Every minute of the day I fought this battle over and over again. And it, and it to me, suicide became a long for way out of this turmoil that I could see no other exit from. And finally, when I got over that, I wanted to jump off the agency's hotel, the Duke Hotel out there, and, and kill myself uh, and hang a banner, the CIA or the CIA lies or something like that, just to try to bring home, to have my death serve some purpose to make the American people realize that, that the truth they were being lied to. Many of the secret warriors in Southeast Asia had no such doubts or regrets. Some of the team that later joined the Iran-Contra enterprise helped to run the secret war in Laos. Coming in from an altitude of about 2,000 feet. As General Richard Secord later put it, Laos belonged to the CIA. American planes blasted the communists in the jungle. And on the ground, we had our own secret army, the Hmong tribesmen. The Hmong fought the communists for 15 years, while our secret government made grandiose promises to them about the future. But we abandoned them to the communist path at Lao in 1975. One third of the mountain people died. Religious groups helped survivors to escape and brought some of them to Wausau, Wisconsin. I wouldn't be here if my father and my brothers were involved, you know, during this secret war. I am here because I have no choice of being here. And I would be, like I said, an example here right now, you know, 27 years after, you know, of a CIA, you know, goof up because they weren't willing to carry through their, you know, goals. They think that it was so simple that people are just like the pawn of a game, like a chess game, you know, that you can move them around anywhere you want. But you have to understand that human life is very different from, you know, playing with human life is different from playing a game. Because a game, you know, once you lose, there's nothing at stake. But when you lose a person's life or devastate a whole country as they did to my country, then it's very important, you know. Please. During the hearings this summer, Oliver North repeated something we've heard often in the last 40 years from presidents and the president's men. I want you to know lying does not come easy to me. I want you to know that it doesn't come easy to anybody. But I think we all had to weigh in the balance the difference between lives and lies. But these memories suggest a different equation. The lives lost because we lied to ourselves and to others. Someone always pays for decisions made secretly in Washington. Looking at such pictures brings to mind the words of an old ally, a Vietnamese official who survived the 